Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Ambassador of Southern Rock YouTube channel. I'm your host, Michael Buffalo Smith, and uh, we're going to have a special guest today. Good friend of mine by the name of Richard Smith. No relation, uh, at least not a blood relative. He might be a spiritual brother. Richard Smith, by, Richard Smith, by day, he's a personal injury lawyer. But he still likes to rock and roll all night and party every day. That's right, baby. He never Absolutely. get too old to rock and roll. Is that right, Richard? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> never that's that's what Jeff Rotol says anyway, right? Yeah, exactly. Very, very true. Um, we're going to talk today a little bit, folks, about live albums. Uh, this is uh, by no means uh, rehearsed. We're going to just go at it, you know, and he doesn't know what my list is and I don't know what his list is, but we're going to each choose our personal five favorite live albums. Now, as y'all know, the live album, especially if you grew up in the seventies and eighties, the live album served as kind of a souvenir of a, a great rock and roll concert. I mean, after you saw a great rock and roll concert and you got the live album by the band, you could sit alone in your bedroom and put your headphones on, close your eyes, and you could be transported right back to the front row at the concert. Oh, man, what a wonderful feeling. I just love the live albums. So uh, as for my part, I picked records that meant something to me in my life, uh, albums that actually changed my life in one way or another or my way of thinking. Um, but before I do my first one, I'm going to uh, say, oh, I got to say this. Please subscribe to the channel, to the Ambassador of Southern Rock channel. It's easy. Just click that red subscribe button and join the throngs of people who um, are informed anytime we post something new on the channel. And there's going to be a lot more coming up. Got some more uh, celebrity interviews coming up and some more uh, explorations into great music so we just hope you guys will join us for the fun the good times without further ado richard smith is going to give me his uh first pick his number five live album yeah so this means a lot to me also uh i used to sit in my garage as a kid and this is one of my parents albums that i played on the turntable in the garage for hours and hours. And it was an album that um, I had every song memorized and I was probably 10. Well, actually, I know when it came out, I'm not sure they got it immediately when it came out, but you know, I would have been less than 10 when this album came out. It came out in 1969, uh, I was born in 1962. So that means I've been seven when this album came out. Um, artist that went on to be one of the greatest artists of all time. He uh, is the only individual to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Songwriters Hall of Fame, and the Country Music Hall of Fame. So my first selection, number five on my list, is Johnny Cash at San Quentin, released in 1969. Wow. It's not the Folsom Prism album that was before that one. This was the one after that that I think is better quality and also this, this is the one that we had, and I played all the time. I used to listen to What a Man. That was a great song. Of course, this is the song that gave us the single Boy Named Stu, the live version of it. I Walked the Line. I really love the story behind the song Starkville City Jail. I don't know if that's a true story or not, but if you get the chance to listen to that track on the album, he goes into a story about how he got arrested in Starkville, Mississippi for picking daisies <laughs> after dark because they had a curfew. That's what he says happened. May it be just a story, maybe the truth, maybe somebody in the comments below can tell us whether it's a true story or not. Man, what a great choice, Richard. Uh, Johnny Cash, wow. And uh, I find it interesting that you uh, you chose San Quentin over the, the more famous uh, Live at Folsom album, but I'm gonna have to agree with you, the San Quentin album, very, very good, really good. And also, like you say, having um, uh, his uh, song that Shel Silverstein wrote, uh, A Boy Named Sue, in a live version was really cool, too. So, yeah, that's a good one. 
Well, uh, my number five is something that will come as no surprise to anybody who knows me. Uh, album came out in 1975 when I was in the uh, 11th grade in high school. I'm a little older than Richard. Uh, it was the first live album by a band who had already recorded three studio albums. And it was the album Kiss Alive. Yep, the title uh, actually was an homage to the British band called Slade, because Slade had put out an album called Slade Alive, and Paul and Gene and everybody, they, uh, they admired the English group Slade, so they decided to call their album Alive. Um, the first three albums that Kiss did had sold moderately well, and uh, Simmons and Stanley decided that the, what the fans really wanted was the live music. So it would be a, a lot of years later that I would learn that the album used canned applause and uh, canned crowd reactions to make it sound more exciting. And also they went back in and basically doctored up everything on the thing to make it sound as good as possible. So it sounds like you're listening to the Beatles at Shea Stadium. <laughs> it's so loud all the way through. Um, I didn't care though, and uh, I mean they they did their best to recreate the uh, the magic of the live Kiss show, and um, yeah, I kind of think it worked out really well. And not only that, it it had this uh, really cool like twelve page color booklet and uh, reproductions of handwritten notes from each of the band members. Little things like that meant a lot to me back then in the in the seventies. I loved the all the free thing. And Kiss was a band that always gave you free stuff with the album. Um, years later, they don't give you anything for free. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're gonna pay for everything. They uh, they just did a highly successful New Year's Eve show yesterday, which is uh, available on YouTube, by the way, already. But for the people who forked out like 50 bucks to watch it on their computer. But the thing that got me was they also offered a deluxe package for $500. So you got to watch it as many times as you want to. Well, yeah. Okay. And, uh, seven items from the band, which they, they didn't say what they, it could be koozies. I don't think it'd be anything really special, but you know, it's whatever, you know, it's, you got to hand it to Gene Simmons. He, he knows capitalism at its finest and it works and, uh, the fans just eat it up and I'm one of them. So there you go. Guilty as charged. That's my, uh, number five. So moving into the number four position with Richard Smith is. But before I do that, I, I would like to comment. That is on my oh. list as well, so I'll get to that okay. in a minute. But, um, yeah, uh, it was definitely a great album. Um, it was probably the, the first really hard rock album that I ever listened to, so it's very important on my list. But my number four is one that I'm sure is probably on your list. Um, it is my favorite live Southern rock album that I listened to. Uh, I used to have it on cassette. And I played it all the time, front and back. Uh, and that is One More From The Road from Leonard Skinner from 1976. <laughs> also on my list. <laughs> yeah, that was one of my favorite albums. Uh, you know, I never have been a huge Freebird fan, I guess, because it's got played so much. You know, I like something at the beginning and then it gets played so much, you kind of get tired of it. But I do, I really like, I really like that song, of course, great song, but I love Give Me Three Steps, Needle and Spoon, They Call Me the Breeze. I mean, all the all their big hits. I just, you know, and I always prefer the live version of almost all the artists to the studio version because I'm a big live music fan. And I know that Kiss didn't know the one that did doctoring in the studio. Most bands did stuff like that. But, you know, if it's going to sound better, I'm all, I'm all for it. I'm not, you know, too concerned about it being an actual live recording because it's hard to get a live recording mixed properly. It sounds great. So certainly no problem with that, but that's my number four. Uh, I'm anxious to hear your comments on that selection. Ah, yes. Yeah, good one. 
All right. Well, and that'll be popping back up on mine too, folks. Like I said, we have, <laughs> we haven't compared notes, but I, I felt like we would have some overlap. It just kind of happens that way. The, um, my, uh, my uh, number four is uh, Grand Funk Railroad, the live album from 1970. Now, uh, it came out in 1970, but actually I didn't hear it or know much about Grand Funk Railroad till sophomore year, probably 73. But that double album came out and it kind of just blew me away. Uh, had uh, that's, They were just starting to have uh, FM radio rock coming out. Uh, until then, we were listening to WORD and Spartanburg hmm. uh, AM radio for everything. But FM was coming out, and they were playing things like uh, they played Heartbreaker from the live Grand Funk and also the Inside Looking Out uh, and the Red Hot. There was a Red Hot Blues tune on there called Mean Mistreater. And who could ever forget Don Brewer's drum showcase, TNUC. And... Uh, one uh, one whole side of an another thing that got me about live albums was uh, they would have like a whole side of an album that was one song, and that happened with Grand Funk with Into the Sun. And um, uh, the one thing that I one thing that I was surprised by on the live album was that they did not include my favorite Grand Funk uh, two for the uh, Closer to Home and I'm Your Captain. It's not on the live album. But uh, anyway, it's uh, they would do it on another live album later on. But the uh, I remember buying this live album. I saved up my grass cutting money, and I bought it at the drug store. Um, it was like I can't. It wasn't CVS because those weren't around. I can't. Maybe Rexall, something like that. I had a small record section, and they had the uh, Grand Funk live album. And I go in there and bought my album at the drug store, but. Grand Funk comes in at number three. Uh, I mean, uh, excuse me, number four. And now number three for, do you have any comments on Grand Funk there? Well, I love them as well. And like you, that is also my favorite song, Closer to Home. Uh, uh, I'm your captain, Closer to Home. But uh, yeah, I, I saw Grand Funk years ago. I think it was not the original lineup. It was after uh, the lead singer had left, um, Mark Forner. Uh, but then... Of course, they're still touring. He's still touring, and he's still doing great uh, music now. Great, great album, I'm sure. Um, my number three, because we talked earlier, we're not doing an artist, but one one choice from each artist, so we can't pick uh, multiple albums from the same artist, even though we probably would if we did not have that selection in there. But this one, there's several live albums that I like of this particular band. Um, this one is special to me because it has the original lineup in it. And it's really before I got into video so much. It's the last really, the, the live CD that I really got into before everything is available on video. So this is actually a, one of the newer selections from our list, I think. It's, uh, is there anybody out there, The Wall Live, 1980, 1981, was released in 2000, but it was recorded from the live shows of The Wall Live, 1980, 81, with the original lineup, including uh, Roger Waters and David Gilmore. Um, I also love Delicate Sound of the Thunder and Pulse, but those are more recent. And I'm pretty much, like I said, those were videos for me. I played the video all the time. This is a CD that I played all the time. And I love the wall, love the live performances, of course. And that's my number third selection. And uh, Richard does doesn't realize they never did say the name of the band is pink floyd pink floyd yes <laughs> as a, we we, take, members we, take, we just like take it for uh, granted that everybody knows these things but the uh boy what a great group i i have to fully agree with that um uh, david gilmore is one of my favorite guitar players of all times and i think R roger waters i recently saw uh, dan rather's big interview with roger waters and that guy's pretty much a genius too so there you go yeah. and speaking of geniuses my number three is um uh back during the 70s during the time that i was uh getting all of my music that i would love for the rest of my life actually um 
this guy from Beaumont, Texas popped up actually him and his brother, <laughs> Edgar and Johnny Winter both, but uh, Edgar Winter held a special place in my heart. His first, um, well, his first real big band was called Edgar Winter's White Trash. And White <laughs> Trash did an album in 72 called Roadwork, a double live album. I'd never heard anything like it at the time. He had a, uh, he shared lead vocals with a guy from, uh, um, also from Texas named Jerry LaCroix, uh, who was, uh, played saxophone and sang. And I never dreamed in my wildest dreams that years later around the turn of the century, I would be friends, become friends with Jerry LaCroix. And we were invited, my wife and I were invited out to Texas, uh, for the turn of the century concert that they did a reunion of Edgar Winter's White Trash with Edgar and Jerry LaCroix and everybody out in uh, Port Arthur, Texas. And I got to be friends with Jerry before uh, I knew him two or three years before, before he passed away. It was really sad when he died. But the man, even when we saw him in 1999, 2000, he, could, he, could, he was still a great singer, great singer. The album, uh, the live album, uh, they had their their only real hit before that was keep playing that rock and roll. And they did a lot of R&B and gospel stuff like uh, Save the Planet, Turn on Your Love Light, and a brilliant cover of Otis Redding's uh, I Can't Turn You Loose, and a great cover of Chuck Berry's Back in the USA. It's wonderful. One of my favorite parts of the whole live album was when Edgar steps up to the microphone and goes, people keep asking me, where's your brother? The crowd goes wild and Johnny steps out out on stage and, and rocked out on rock and roll hoochie coo. And uh, also another great thing. There's so many great moments of this album, but one that will forever be burned into my brain is a 17 minute version of the old blues J.D. Loudermilk milk tune called uh, Tobacco Road. Wonderful. Edgar Winters White Trash Road Work is my number three. That's great. So we're down to number two. And um, this one, I'm, I would be surprised if it's not on your list. If it's not, it's, I'm sure it's on your honorable mission list. But it's uh, this album to me has completely changed my life in terms of music. Uh, I've gotten it on almost every format. I've got it on, uh, I've got it on download. I had it on CD. I had it on album. I had it on eight track. I mean, everything. And it's um, just is the album that stands out in this particular artist's career too, the long career. And he's had a lot of hits after this, but this album is what he always is known for. And it was such a huge album when I was growing up uh, in high school. It's a 1976's Frampton Comes Alive. With Peter Frampton's classical, you know, li uh, live album. Um, that was, you know, love the musical and that, of course, everybody loves, do you feel like I do? Show me the way, lines on my face, baby, I love your way. All those great songs that were produced in that album. A lot of them were, were older songs. Some of them were covers, but just the way he performed them with his great guitar work, fantastic album that really, you know, changed my life in music, got me really into live music, even more than I already was when I heard that album. Well, I fully agree with that. That was uh, that was the soundtrack of my senior year in high school. Yeah, it was wonderful. And it's so funny that, I mean, he had an illustrious career before that, uh, being with Humble Pie and everything, but people didn't really know about Frampton that much until that album came out. And all of a sudden he was like everywhere, everywhere. That was a good one. Um, my number two is, uh, you've already mentioned, but I'm going to mention it again. My number two is Leonard Skinner, One More From The Road. One of two albums in my top list that were produced by the late, great Tom Dowd, a wonderful record producer who worked with everybody from uh, Aretha Franklin. Oh gosh, all the jazz greats and then the uh, the great Southern rock greats and uh, just everybody's a wonderful producer um, and engineer. 14 tracks. This album went triple platinum. 
um, in a time when uh, going triple platinum was kind of unheard of. Now, triple platinum means that there was over three million albums sold, not three million dollars worth, but three million copies were sold. Standout versions. Uh, one of the great things I, I love about that album is the live um, Jimmy Rogers T for Texas, T for Tennessee. Well, I never get tired of that. And of course, everybody, everybody on everybody on the planet, and people on other planets <laughs> have heard Freebird Live a million times. Over fourteen minutes of Freebird. Um, Here's a little bit of trivia for the Skinner Nation. A little bit of trivia. What was the biggest Leonard Skinner hit that was not on the live album? Oh, wow. Hard to believe. Sweet Home Alabama was not on the live album. But they added it to the second CD release of the album in 1996. Oh. But the original did not have Sweet Home on it. But it sure had a whole lot of honk, as Ronnie would say. Good stuff, man. I mean to tell you, it doesn't get much better than that. And that's my number two. Yeah, I, I had the cassette version. It was it was on the cassette version, I believe. Hmm. Or, I mean, or, or the one that I had had it on. The the I had a different issue, reissue yeah. of it, yeah. uh, possibly. Yeah, the original. I mean, it was a great, one. great album, no doubt about it. I have a little quick story about about uh, Freebird. A few years ago, me and my wife saw uh, Brian Adams unplugged at the Peace Center. It was a fantastic concert. And he was talking to the audience after doing his set and doing a little break between songs. And he said something about, anybody have a request, anything you want to hear? And somebody shouted out Freebird. <laughs> and he started playing a little bit of it. I said, no, I'm not going to try to play the dual guitar part. I'll play a little bit of it. <laughs> he played a few bars of Freebird and said, there's no way I can play that acoustic guitar with one guitar player but it was pretty funny that even they even the, even that type of concert anybody says what songs that you want to hear you automatically go to freebird from that live album that's true album. well i guess we can guess my number one now since i we've already said i was is in my top list i've happened to have the original album here is my number one kiss uh, alive as well and wow. not because so much of it is critically great but because in my personal life that was the album for me when I was like I said I'm a little bit younger than you so when I first a friend of mine uh, gave me an eight track copy he recorded it on eight track from the original album to, to play and I played it on my I had one of those little eight track boom boxes um, that you could sing to also it was a little cheap thing and I played that and I'd never heard anything like that. I mean, I, my parents were country music fans. I liked Elvis Presley. I listened to a little bit of, uh, you know, mostly country music. I heard the Beatles. That was a big thing for me, but I'd never heard anything close to hard rock, you know, or anything like that. And that just kind of, you know, wild me big time. So then I played that album over and over and over again. And I really do think it stands out to this day at all the, all their many albums, I think Ace's guitar work on um, on, Par on on Parasite and She, the live versions are is just outstanding. It's a lot better than I think anything else he's done with Kiss. Um, I know that Kiss Alive too. He wouldn't he, he didn't play much on that album, but but this is an album he did play on, and I think he did a great job on his live parts. And the live versions were just so much better than the studio versions because it, it really captured the energy of the concert. And it was something that I really still love. I still every now and then get in that mood and I'll go, you know, play it. So it's something that still stands, stands up today for me. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, I agree with you 100%. I, um, as you were speaking, I was flashing back to when I had gotten news, you know, before the Internet days. Uh, I got all my music news from Cream Magazine and Circus. Once in a while, Rolling Stone, but it was a little too heady for me. I liked Cream and Circus and um, things like that. And and I'd heard that, you know, they were putting out a live album. And I was really excited. So I had already been calling around Spartanburg, South Carolina here. 
uh, record bar at, and uh, Camelot Music. They were like, well, we're not sure when we're going to get in. So I found a, uh, there used to be a little record store and bookstore over near, um, not far from your office, I think. It was over there near um, where it used to be Spartan Mill and all. But there was Mercury Music and Mercury News side by side. So it was a bookstore and then a record store. So Mercury Music, <laughs> the guy said, yeah, 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 we've already got them in. Um, uh, can I come get one? He goes, well, no, we can't sell it till tomorrow morning at nine when we open. So the next morning I was there at nine o'clock to get my Kiss Alive album. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I was such a fan. I took it out in my car, ripped that thing open. And I was looking for the, uh, the booklet with all the color pictures and it wasn't in there. And I freaked out. I went running back in there and I told him, and I still, don't, I, to this day, I think the guy thought I was lying to him. <laughs> so I'd get an extra copy of the book, but no, it wasn't in there. So he took that album back and gave me another one. And uh, I've still got it. It was pretty weird. I, I mean, I've still got it. I kind of wore the vinyl out and ended up getting other copies subsequently in the future, you know, and also on CD and all like that. But yeah, once in a while, I still like to, to listen to that. And knowing that they doctored it up, it doesn't bother me at all because, I mean, I've studied a lot about music in the past few years and almost all, I would think almost, almost all live albums have things where they went in and corrected, you know, made, you know, fix things. So it would sound more, more perfect, but anyway, yeah, great one. My, um, down to my number one, and, uh, this is, uh, I'm going to go out and on a limb here and be fully transparent and say that, uh, it's not only my favorite live album, it's my favorite album of all time. And uh, I've said that for probably 40 years, so I'm not going to change my story now. And it is an album called At Fillmore East by the Allman Brothers Band. 1971, Tom Dowd produced it. Not only the greatest live album ever, but the greatest album ever. Double live, two two LPs and um, it was the first time I'd seen an album where a single song took up uh, a whole side of an album like it did with You Don't Love Me and um, and also on side four was Whipping Post that was the only song on there so anyway uh, yeah classic versions of Stormy Monday States Royal Blues Done Somebody Wrong Hot Lana and of course, Dickie Betts is famous instrumental in memory of Elizabeth Reed. The clock's in at over 11 minutes. At Fillmore East, greatest album in the history of the world. But don't don't take my word for it. Go out and listen to it, folks. I know you've heard it before. If you hadn't, go, go out and find it. And it's on, uh, get on Spotify, listen to it, whatever. But it's a great one. Uh, which will move us into the category of honorable mentions. And uh, I've got a handful here. So you, you go ahead and do yours first. Just run down whatever you want to give us an honorable mention. And... Okay. Um, well, I did some more honorable mentions. One I would put, definitely put in there is, uh, is Elvis Live at Madison Square Garden in 1972 release because if you've heard the remastered version it is amazing um being a big Elvis fan all my life of course my parents were but uh you know it's hard to to me old analog music doesn't come across as well as remastered music does to me I know some people disagree they like the original analog version better but the remastered version of that concert is really good there's no fluff there's no talking to fans and stuff it is just solid concert i really love jerry shift's bass playing i'm a bass player myself i love jerry shift's bass playing on several of those songs number next one i had is kansas two for the show released in 1978 oh yeah and remastered right. in 2008 big kansas fan you know love 
the live versions of Carry On My Way With Sun, Dust on the Wind and the Wall. Then I would say my next choice would be Eagles, Hell Freezes Over. Mm -hmm. um, I like that first production value. Again, I like more digitally uh, remastered music. The original Eagles live album has a song on it that I like better, and it's not on this particular version, I don't think, and that is Seven Bridges Road. I love that song by the Eagles. I don't think it's on this this release, but I had this, the DVD for this, and I love it, and I played it a lot, so that's one of my choices. Also, the next one would be Styx Return to Paradise, released in 1997. Mm. It's a reunion concert live album with Dennis DeYoung, who I love. He was in that uh, album, you know, all, all their hits. I love you know, Come Sail Away, uh, Blue Collar Man, all those great hits. And then two more right quick, and I'll let you list your list. And uh, one's the band that's a relatively new band compared to most of our artists here. That, and I love Linkin Park. So I had Linkin Park Road to Revolution released in 2008. Love, it's kind of difficult on, on the production value. It's really loudly produced. But the songs are great. I love Numb, What I've Done, The End, Leave Out All the Rest. Hard to listen to some of those songs now after Chester's death because it's so autobiographical with the lyrics. You know, you can you listen to the song lyrics. You can hear him talking about depression and about, you know, you know what's going to happen in the future, which was terrible to him. But just a great artist, great singer, great band. And then one that I almost put in my top five, Deep Purple Made in Japan. Mm. Released yeah. in 1973, best version of Smoke on the Water ever released. Highway Stars, great, Strange Kind of Woman, Child in Time, and Lazy. Big, deep purple fan, big Blackmore fan as well. Me too. Wow. Yeah, that's a good one. Good list. Well, man, that's great. Uh, kicking off my honorable mentions is uh, one you've already spoken to, but uh, I've got to say, uh, once again, the soundtrack of my senior year in high school was Peter Frampton, Frampton Comes Alive. Uh, just really good. Uh, Show Me the Way, Baby, I Love Your Way, Do You Feel Like We Do. Um, you know, uh, it reached uh, number 15 position, by the way, and Billboard Hot 100 uh, was the best-selling album of 1976 sold over 8 million copies in the United States alone and became one of the best selling live albums by anybody to date with estimated sales of over 11 million copies worldwide. Pretty good for old Peter, uh, really good stuff. And uh, I just, uh, I, I, even to this day, if I hear, you know, I've, I've said before, I'm not a fan of classic rock radio, but Basically, it is what it is. That's what we've got. Now, anytime I'm in the car, if I've got on the radio, that's about the only choice there is, that or talk radio, and I don't want to hear talk radio. So it's got, <laughs> uh, you know, you flip it on, and you'll hear Frampton doing uh, Show Me the Way or Baby, I Love Your Way. Um, or, oh, oh, no, Do You Feel Like We Do? They play that one a lot. And I never get tired of it. I, I always like to hear that. Um, and uh, speaking of Peter Frampton, keeping the theme alive with another honorable mention is Humble Pie uh, and an album called Rock in the Fillmore, 1971. It's a classic, classic live album. Uh, their song, I Don't Need No Doctor, was uh, the hit that they had from the album. Steve Marriott and Peter Frampton, produced by Eddie Kramer. And that's interesting that Eddie Kramer produced bands like that and then he went on to produce Kiss and uh, produced the Kiss Alive album. Uh, they uh, did a great cover of Ray Charles' song, Hallelujah, I Love Her So. Uh, and another full side song cover of Dr. John's great song, I Walk on Gilded Splinters. Oh man, great album. Uh, another one that I've got to mention that changed my world was in 1995 a more recent thing even though when you say recent it really had not been that recent has it but it seems like for us it is <laughs> yeah for us it is and it's when pink floyd did an album called pulse 
Uh, and it was basically the same as the concert I saw them do in Clemson. And that was, uh, I was there that, too. yeah. Oh yeah. That blew my ever loving mind. How good that was. So Pulse, I'll put that on and it opens with that very long version of, uh, shine on crazy diamond with Gilmore playing a guitar with more heart and soul than pretty much anybody. I mean, it's so wonderful. And then, um, then they do, uh, you know, uh, uh, another brick in the wall part, uh, part two, which includes parts of another brick in the wall, part one. Uh, I never did quite understand the titles, but that's okay. Um, it's, uh, like I say, my favorite part of the whole thing is shot on crazy diamond. That's 13 minutes of, uh, guitar magic and, um, breathe in the air. Wish you were here us and them comfortably numb. What else do you want folks? Pink Floyd pulse, 1995, jumping back a few years. Uh, another honorable mention one that changed my life in a great way. Uh, Johnny winter. And he had a band called Johnny winter and kind of an interesting name uh 1971 live johnny winter and um one of some of my earliest exposure to rock and blatant rock and roll i mean really um it was it was years later before i would learn that jumping jack flash was a rolling stones song i just knew johnny winter's version on the live album and it's what made me want to pick up a guitar and I did and try to emulate the sounds, even though I had no lessons, no idea how to tune a guitar. Uh, wouldn't have had a guitar had it not been for my sweet sister who bought me a Tysco <laughs> at Kmart. I think she paid $29.95 for the Tysco Del Rey electric guitar. I was going to be a great guitar player and I still hope that maybe one day I will, uh, the, um, the live album also he did, it was mostly covers. Good morning. Little school girl, mean town blues, Johnny be good, a rock and roll medley that had great balls, fire and long tall Sally, whole lot of shaking going on rock from start to finish. And, uh, just great Johnny winter. And, and my last one, like I got to mention, that I just feel like it's just so much energy piled into a mono recording before stereo, a 1963 album that I heard when I was a kid, I didn't a bit more know who this was. I just knew that it felt like energy and it's a high energy and the whole album's less than 30 minutes long. And there's James Brown live at the Apollo theater, 1963. How I feel good, man. I'm going to tell you, it was just energy just oozing out of that. I was like, yeah, man got soul. And I felt it. I felt it running right through my pores. So anyway, that's, that's, that's my honorable mentions. And, um, I, uh, I guess that'll, that'll wrap up my, uh, List, you got any footnotes? I think we covered a lot of ground today. I mean, it just shows you how much life before Frampton comes alive and Kiss Alive, which is like, which is actually a little bit before Frampton Comes Alive came out. Before the, I guess, probably going back to the uh, Almond Brothers album, was that before uh, Kiss Alive? Yeah, 1971. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's when the live album really became a big deal. Before those albums, I mean, there's, I don't think there's anything in the 60s besides the one you just mentioned, maybe. But yeah. I mean, none of the Beatles albums were live. I mean, uh -huh. I think they, I don't think that they ever re released that one with the Shea Stadium. I think they did recently, they did, when, in the new movie that they did, they released some songs from the Shea Stadium concert remixed. But back in the day, they never released a live album, to my knowledge. Well, yeah. If you did a Beatles live album back then, you wouldn't be able to hear the music anyway. Right. Uh, it's like, you see the film is, uh, is people don't understand how much, how many thousands, thousands of girls screaming can completely drown out a PA system. I know. But I, I took my daughter one time to go see the Jonas brothers 
in oh, Charlotte. No. And that was a big mistake. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I, I did, I mean, I had to leave and go out in the, in the concession area to get away from that wall of sound of young girls screaming. And I'm sure, and that wasn't as big a crowd as you would have had at Shea Stadium by any means. So I can imagine there was just no way to hear anything if you were at that concert. That's true. Well, well, we'll 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 go, we'll go ahead and put a lid on it then, man. Uh, appreciate you, uh, Richard Smith, for um, sharing your uh, your favorite live albums and a lot of fun. We'll have to do it again sometime. We'll see. Uh, we'll come up with another category. Appreciate it. You guys put some comments in about albums that you think are great live albums that we didn't cover, and we covered a lot of them, I know. But there's a lot of them out there that we haven't covered. Oh yeah. So always. You know, and hit that subscription bell as well. I mean, the, uh, right. not the notification bell, not the subscription bell. That, Over. And hit the subscription button. Yes. Yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, and uh, keep those cards and letters coming. <laughs> all right, folks, thanks Emails. for watching, and thank you, Richard Smith. Appreciate it, man. Making it back to make it. Give me some grits. Gravy and bacon, just a little something to tide me over. The Mama Louise and the H and H open. She got fried chicken and pinto beans, hot cornbread, sweet iced tea, everything that a body needs. That's why I'm making it back to make Give me some grits. Gravy and bacon, just a little something to hold me over to Mama Lou.